Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today for what I'm sure is going to be an amazing webinar. My name is Max Murray. I'm the head of entertainment at Faceware, and you've joined us for the latest in our webinar series. Every month, Faceware hosts industry professionals to talk through the, their expertise related to facial animation or motion, or a notable client of ours who's working on a unique project that we wanted to shed some light on. If you've missed any of these, including our chat with the IDOS Montreal team about their facial animation in the Guardian of the Galaxy game, you can find this on our YouTube channel or go to our GoToWebinar channel as well. Today, as you all must know, I have the pleasure of welcoming Melinda Ozell. Melinda is an expert and educator in all things related to facial movement and expression. She's a consultant around the entertainment industry and tech industry that guides on proper anatomical face behavior, and she runs the ever popular site slash blog, Face the Facts. Melinda, hey, welcome. How are you? <laughs> hey, Max. Thanks for the intro. It's good to be here. Shout out to Faceware. Thanks for putting this together, and thanks, everyone, for showing up. I'm going to pull up a little presentation for you all. Um, let me do just before you do, Melinda. Let me just let me just give a couple of reminders to everybody in the audience here, okay. which is um, just to give you some credit here, which is that everybody should know that we have a record number of signups today. And I just want to give all the praise to you, Melinda. All of your fans are in attendance. Everybody is <laughs> eager to hear what you have to show and present to us today. And I know there's a ton of people that have a lot of questions for you as well. So as a note to everybody in the, in the audience and watching, we're doing a Q&A at the end. We're saving plenty of time for that. So uh, you'll see a little field here in your panel on the right or wherever you have your screen orientation. There's a little questions field. As Melinda goes through a presentation or at the end when we start going through some questions, anything you've got, throw it in there. We're going to try to get through as many of them as we can. Uh, but that's it. That's all I wanted to say. So Melinda, please, now, please take that, take the stage. <laughs> take it away all okay so let me get into ooh, not that version of share um slideshow share all right so this is face facts and beyond with me melinda ozal so thanks for attending this talk today nice to meet you if you don't already know me my name is melinda i have been studying the face for over 10 years now, I used to work in face and emotion tracking tech at Meta and Affectiva, but in the last few years, I pivoted to focusing on uh, expression science and applying that to the entertainment world and working with companies in film, game, and tech. So I've gotten to work with a lot of awesome creative studios in those three industries, and I've really been enjoying the consulting and education life. I'm always excited to work with new people and new studios. So if you want to get a training session or consulting services or uh, just get a portfolio review or individual training session, don't hesitate to reach out to me. My email address is over here. You'll also have access to all of my social links. Um, beyond consulting and training, I'm always researching, learning and sharing new information about facial expressions and also beyond facial expressions. Anything from anatomical diversity to blink behavior, speech production, or how tears are formed. So if the face interests you, if psychology interests you, you can follow me on any of my social channels. You can also follow along um, my blog, melindaozell.com. I have a lot of free resources there. I post a lot of free resources on my Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn as well. So now that we've gotten to know each other, an itinerary of the discussion today is going to be what exactly is facts, who needs to know facts and why, and then how facts is applied to different style ranges. So the burning question, what exactly is facts? FACTS is an acronym that stands for the Facial Action Coding System. It was a, a system developed in the 70s by psychology researchers to taxonomize and cod codify observable movements of the human face. Here's a couple of examples of combination expressions and the type of nomenclature that's used to describe them. And that will all make sense in a couple slides from now. So what is FACTS used for? Fax is used in a number of industries. It's used in art, science, and technology. It's used because it's simple and practical. It's descriptive and standardized. It's been well-researched. And barring any anatomical anomalies, it's universal. And even with those anatomical anomalies, it can still be applicable. So how Fax works is it breaks down the face into what 
facts and the creators of facts considers to be the smallest units of movement. And those small units of movement are referred to as action units. And if you're in the facts world, or if you're familiar with facts, you're most likely going to be calling action units AUs. So if you see those two letters together, that's what they stand for. So action units are anatomically based. They usually represent a single muscle, for example, uh, usually, but there are, uh, usually they represent a single muscle or sections of a muscle or multiple muscles, but let's, let's go back for a second. So when they represent a single muscle, for example, when we, the most prototypical version of a smile typically engages a muscle called lip corner puller. Lip corner puller is represented by the zygomaticus major muscle. So when zygomaticus major activates, that's when action unit 12 or lip corner puller is identified on the face. Action units can also represent sections of a muscle. So our muscles can move in distinct sections. Uh, one of those examples of a muscle that can move in distinct sections is the frontalis muscle. It's a muscle that spans across our forehead. You can move just the inner portion, the medial section called inner brow razor, or you can move the outer section, which engages outer brow razor, the lateral portion of the muscle. Action units can also represent multiple muscles. So one of those Examples of an action unit that represents multiple muscles is action unit four, known as brow lower. Personally, in the work that I do, I prefer to separate out the different movements of brow lower because um, I think it's more interesting and engaging and it's just overall better if you're looking at details to separate out the different muscle movements because it is possible to separate them out. But because FACTS was originally created for behavioral research, um, for their intents and purposes, brow lower or lump together was what they found to be the ideal uh, action unit at the time. So basically, action units provide us with building blocks for breaking down expressions and emotions. Beyond human facts, there's also animal facts. So there's cat facts, dog facts, chimp facts, mac facts, echo facts, and baby facts. And yes, babies are humans, but they have different facial fat content. So a different fact system was actually developed to codify expression babies. So who needs to know facts and why? Starting with the view of it all. Anyone who works on anything that tracks, mimics, masks, analyzes facial expressions should know facts or at least be familiar with it, especially if your work affects the, the way we interact with each other and our world. That includes modelers, riggers, animators, engineers, computer scientists working on face-related content. So basically anyone working with facial expressions should at least be familiar with facts, your level of familiarity, your expertise. The demand for that will differ depending on what industry you're in, what level uh, of involvement you have with the facial expressions. So not everyone has to be an expert. So the why of it all, the face is complicated. For people who are working together to create products or services that involve facial expressions should be able to communicate clearly with each other and facts provides a communication tool and a systematic language to be able to talk to each other and discuss, hey, this looks off, this is why, uh, as opposed to just saying, um, you know, this area over here looks wrong when they smile. I don't totally know why. It gives you the tools to communicate what you need to. And FACTS is basically there just for that. It allows you to categorize facial expressions and communicate the puzzling movements of the face. And FACTS applies to a range of styles. Uh, as a tool for building and breaking down facial expressions, as I just said, facts is applicable to a bunch of different styles. It can go as something from as simple as emoji to something as complicated as a photo real character. It can also be used to inform expression design of non-human creatures, whether that's real or imaginary. As you can see, for the real, we had chimpanzee facts, horse facts, cat facts, dog, dog facts, etc. For example, one action unit that I mentioned previously when talking about the sections of the muscle action units, inner brow razor from the frontalis muscle. Here are some examples of it on real people. 
as well as stylized characters, an alien and emoji. So even though this facial expression, even though there are different levels of stylization, the principles of this movement, the inner brow going up can be applied to different styles and different creatures. Same thing with the action unit 18, lip pucker. And this applies to all action units. Any action unit, any facial action can be applied to any level of stylization, any character that has a face, even something that might not have a face. You can still manipulate features to kind of be personified and mimic human expressions. If you need to build an expression library for an existing or imaginary creature, facts because fax is so detailed and derived in anatomy, it makes it possible to do so. So last year, I ended up working with a studio who wanted to create a fax for capuchins because fax doesn't, there's no animal fax for capuchins at present. I created one called cat fax. So because I already know so much about fax, and I was able to take advantage of existing fax for different primates and apply those principles to capuchin facial expressions by observing them and studying their facial expressions and identifying analogous facial expressions. So this, for example, would be the lip pucker equivalent in a capuchin. So that just goes to show you how far an organized and structured system can take you. And I know in this presentation, I focused a lot on animation but there are a lot of different areas facts can be applied to and a lot of interesting subjects to talk about like facts and robots and I have some photography friends in here so feel free to ask any questions related to facts and photography or facts for actors or facts in deep fakes and other face related technology so if you feel like your area of interest wasn't mentioned in this presentation that's what the Q&A at the end of the talk is for so feel free to drop your questions then and that's the end. Let's get our chat on. Awesome. Cool. All right. Thank you. So yeah, as Melinda said, if you guys have any questions, throw them in chat. I have a handful just from watching that that I know I wanted to go through first, but then I'll mix in my questions with what starts coming in from everybody else. Uh, so maybe we start just the main benefit of facts. What do you see, um, especially for our industry, the main benefit of using something like facts? Yeah, so facts is a simplified and structured way to break down the face. Normally when we look at facial expressions, if we're not accustomed to breaking it down and categorizing the movements, we're kind of looking at this holistic blob and we're like, oh, we see an expression as a bunch of things happening at once and how do you break it down and figure out what's going on? Facts is really useful for um, breaking down those intricate pieces. So basically solving the puzzle of the face and helping you recognize patterns. If you're an animator and you want to create more believable characters, you should be looking at people in everyday life or things in everyday life and being able to know, oh, when that person was chewing, they did these different facial actions or these different facial movements. So when I'm creating a character that's eating something, I'm able to replicate that without, um, without having to look at it as like a, a weird bunch of things happening at one's blob. Um, so pattern recognition, identification, and also it's because it's anatomically derived. If you're trying to communicate facial expressions on a character, whether it's uh, human, non-human, stylized, non-stylized, at the end of the day, you're replicating a fa facial movement and facial movement is created by muscle movement and all of the other structures of the face. So you wanna be able to replicate that in order for it to be relatable. You want people to understand what you're conveying and portraying. Yep, that makes sense to me. What about um, limitations? Are there any shortcomings, things that people have to make up in other ways? Yeah, so because Fax was originally created for behavioral research, um, some of the movements in it are a bit too broad. So I feel that the face can actually be broken down further, um, especially as it relates to the mouth area. So for speech production, for, for example, there's a lot more fine detailed movement than is broken down in facts. So people who are working on lip sync might struggle to get realistic looking lip movements if they're just using the action units that facts has to offer. 
I got you. What about um, what about specifically for an animator? Why should an animator use it? I know you touched on this a little bit about uh, a second ago with the main benefits of facts. But is there if if there's anybody that has hesitation to running over to this, uh, you know, in our industry, is there any compelling words to bring them over? Yeah. Um. So sometimes I hear arguments from animators that, um, if I I have pointed out things in the past where, um there is a common mistake of incorrectly representing the cheek razor expression. And so I've commented on a few characters I've seen in movies that could be improved on that. And some feedback that I've gotten from animators is it's uh, style versus anatomy, appeal versus anatomy. Um, that's a false dichotomy. That is an oversimplification of it. It's not either or. It's a balance of both. So in order to, like, an animated character is a derivative of a human. It's a derivative of human expression. So if you want to be able to communicate those ideas and what you want to show, you should be able to have at least basic facts knowledge or basic anatomy knowledge. Otherwise, you're kind of making it up. It's like a musician who doesn't know how to read music unless you're one of the like greatest prodigies or geniuses in the world who should know how to read music. <laughs> yeah, that's a good that's a good comparison. Uh, you're you're doing I liked your example earlier of like doing a lot of like I just want more of this and it's like that's not a universal language. Not everybody knows what that means, you know. Oh yeah, and also further a uh, further point to that. I don't know why I didn't think of this. Um, you're as an animator, you're working cross functionally with other teams. It a lot of times animators want to break down the rig further and further, so they want to have more control of it. But then, the, uh, some of the problems with that are if you want to break down a muscle that typically has, like, for example, cheek razor, it's going to pull down the eyebrow a little bit, it's going to pull up the cheek area, and that's happening in one swell, uh, in one fell swoop. Um, it's not happening in two distinct movements. So if you have that separated and you don't have knowledge of facts or anatomy, when you're creating expressions for your character later on, you may not remember to add those two movements together. And so that's probably one of the reasons that I see so many animated characters with not great looking cheek razors. It's also helpful to communicate with the rigging team if you see something that's not moving right. Um, when you're trying to animate, you can say, hey, the lip corner puller needs to have a more upward and diagonal pull. It's not working the way it's supposed to because like otherwise it's difficult. It's really difficult to describe things like that if you don't have like more technical knowledge. That makes sense. Um, you were talking about capuchin facts and like, of course, I had to stop and just imagine what the world of animal facts must consist of, like cat facts. I can't, I can't imagine my life without, now that I know about cat facts, I need to, I need that in my life. So I was specifically wondering about capuchin facts when you were going through um, their actual expressions. Does that relate to emotions as well? Because like in human, I put these two terms together, like if in an animation term, I want to see this character express joy. So we're doing, you know, you're you're giving specific AUs in order to achieve that. Um, but how does this go for the like animal behavior and expressions and emotions? Oh, yeah, great question. So that is going to depend on if you're going for more like natural type of animal expression or if you're trying to personify it or if you're trying to find a balance of both. So if you're going for the more natural, realistic expressions, uh, which we were going for in the capuchin one um, that I worked on, then yes, studying studying the animal behavior and how they act in the wild, or if it's a like a pet capuchin versus a wild capuchin, how is it interacting around people versus uh, what other wild capuchins? Um, so for that, I had to study. Um, existing research as well as watch a lot of video references and come up with my own classification of different types of emotions or behaviors that were relevant to the film um, that the capuchin was going to be in. So I mean the wild ones are pretty difficult because getting footage of a wild animal that's clear and good quality is not easy so a lot of it was blurry and then I'd had had to compensate um, with finding good movements on cap captive capuchins. Um, if you're going the personified route, you can still use 
you're then you're still using action units regardless which way you go it's just like are you gonna try to use whatever ones look most like a smile for humans or which ones you know what i mean yep. yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense you're, you're if you want it to be more personified yeah thanks for explaining that um so i'm gonna kind of bridging into that the, the stylized non-human faces um you, you went a little bit into this in your presentation but i was wondering if you could go a little deeper uh specifically non-human characters how and stylized characters how they differ from if you're doing like a, a pure one-to-one -one realistic character um yeah let me i think a visual might be helpful for this one so let me pull up couple of images such um when you're working with stylized versus realistic or um non-human versus human you're essentially going to be creating the same expressions but just with different boundaries and different facial landmarks so for example um uh let's see the way that a cheek razor would affect a chimpanzee or an orangutan or a Barbie doll would have different boundaries than it would on a uh, non-stylized human face, an actual human face. So it's sort of like, where are you gonna remap those landmarks? Um, are there other structures going on that can interfere with the expression? How can you take advantage or work around those structures? Um, one issue that's you can't see here. Um, I worked on a stylized cartoony dog and um, when we had to do a funnel shape, it became really difficult to um, change the lip formation to work with the the long shape of the dog's mouth with uh, the eversion or fanning out of the lips. So, um, I mean, these are oops, easier examples. So. It just comes down to remapping things and changing the facial landmarks and working with what you have. So there's a lot of different ways to approach that. Okay. Well, what about um, you know, your you talked about a little bit about how you've consulted in different areas. What are you who are you most commonly working with? Um, hold on, let me minimize something. Um, I most late, lately I've worked with a lot of gaming companies. Um so people who want to improve their facial performance, uh, facial animation pipeline. Um, I'm doing, I've done a lot of training for uh, game companies. Um, like my clients list, I've worked with EA, Epic, Blizzard. They were all awesome to work with. Um, so I do, I've done like different levels of training sessions. Some are just basic overviews of facts. Other ones are more detailed in going over anatomical variations and anatomical diversity, which is one of my favorite things to study. Um, on the film side or uh, like TV and film, that's where I've worked more on primate expressions. So I'm working on a show with a chimpanzee, a realistic chimpanzee character, and then the capuchin one. So I'm always thinking about ape and monkey facts. Gotcha. Yeah, I've heard you talk about that for like a year now, so I could tell that this is becoming a specialty. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What about um like I know this is a little bit uh, it's probably hard to sum everything down into one area, but is there a typical engagement with the client? Like, are you always brought in to consult an existing area, uh, existing character that they already have, or are you coming in from the ground level? Uh, and then if you had any examples that you can like share with folks to, to show like exactly how you've helped in any of these teams. Yeah, I would say there's not a typical engagement with the client. It's so variable. I can, let me see what, I have some examples I could show. Uh, okay, share screen, slideshow. Okay, so I worked with the MetaHuman team like uh, a bit over a year ago as well, around the Capuchin time. And so what I did with them was I gave a lot of focus on anatomical diversity. So talking about how the same expression on different people uh, will look different and how wrinkles will form differently and the movement will have slightly different um, uh, peaks of pull. So for uh, example, 
the muscle on her forehead frontalis. There, in most anatomy books, you'll see something like this. But in reality, it can have any of these and more types of configurations. It can have a full split in the middle. It can have a skinny split or a wide split and even an angled um, shape to it. Some of them go directly on, uh, below the eyebrows or slightly above and the way that it's intermingled with other, other muscles is also variable and all of that is gonna affect the way that the expression looks on different people. So that was one thing I really focused on with them. And then just looking at um, the relationship between the muscles and the surrounding muscles and how the holistic expressions or combination expressions might interact with each other. What else do I have? Um, muscle tethering and different types of intermingling of the muscles. I also have a couple of exam ah, <laughs> examples of projects I worked on for design, like emoji when I was at Facebook, I, and also when I was not at Facebook and when I was just freelancing, I worked with the emoji team on making sure that their newest release of emoji worked well with all the different um, styles of emoji. Like if you were sending a message to somebody on, uh, on your desktop on Facebook, you're sending a message to someone who has an iPhone, you wanna make sure that Though there are different designs of the same face, the designs are not harming the intent of the expression. So, for example, the release of Facebook, the design that they wanted to release, all the eyes were flat bottom as opposed to the traditional uh, oval eye that all other emoji vendors were using. So I wrote an opinion piece when I was working there about how that was a harmful design choice that would actually impact the interpretation of the expression by either dampening it or exaggerating it. So for example, even on something as simple as an emoji, facts can affect, uh, facts can be utilized. So for example, the flat bottom eyes can actually mimic something like a cheek razor or a lid tightener, and those are uh, eye narrowing expressions. And um, the combination of cheek razor with this, with different types of smiles will amp up the expression of joy or excitement or happiness. And when it's applied to a sad face, it can also exaggerate that expression. So I worked with them to have a more mindful approach to, they still got to use their flat bottom eye design, but they got to use it, instead of applying it blankly on all emoji, they applied it on just certain ones that already had a higher, more amped up expression. So from that, we had such a good time working together that when I left Facebook uh, or Meta, oops, um, <laughs> I they contracted me to work on the care emoji with them. So paying attention to the animation and the expression of the care care design. What else do I have? Ooh, so yeah, I can work with companies in so many different ways. It depends. Do you want me to look at a design and help you make it better? Um, do you want me to evaluate your ROM or even create a ROM for you? So um, I recently created a tongue ROM for a company. Um, and I did so much research about the tongue, mus uh, tongue muscles and they're so complicated. So if anyone needs a tongue ROM or a tongue research, um, <laughs> I feel pretty good about my knowledge about tongues at this point and a lot of face tracking technology is not good with tongue tracking. So I definitely know there's a demand. Um, and yeah, I could also do portfolio help as well. Those are those are just like a few examples of many different ways I could engage with a client. Um, but I do when I'm uh, consulting or uh, observing a product, I'm a very visual. I take a very visual approach, so I'll do a lot of drawovers, notes. I'll send them reference examples. Um, diagrams galore um and then also some written text as well okay uh, yeah. yeah it seems like a wide variety there i I'm, I'm appreciate all the examples that's really helpful to kind of see the wide swath that you can kind of jump into the pipeline and it doesn't feel like any team could say um well we're past the point we'll just catch melinda on the next one you know or anything like that <laughs> yeah uh, i like being a researcher 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what about um? What are areas outside of facts? Uh, any any other specific topics uh, that you're working on that apply to face? Maybe outside of facts, right? Yeah. So I'm really interested. I've been really interested in anatomy for the last couple of years. Not just uh, what's this muscle? What's that muscle? But like, what is the chemical makeup of this muscle? What kind of fibers does it have? How does it move? What are the physics of this muscle? Really interested in microanatomy, and then that's also kind of how I got into the whole muscle variation and uh, face diversity um, thing kick that I've been on for a while now. Um, and also just other things that aren't facial expressions or aren't facts, like what are some color changes you might see in the face when somebody is laughing or sad? There's definitely different types of blood flow with different facial expressions and that's technically not facts, that's technically not a facial expression, but that is super interesting and awesome and face related. So that's why this is called Face Facts and Beyond. Um, and then I'm also interested in the psychology aspect of things. So uh, for example, I did a deep dive a few months ago on blink rate and blink timing and different types of blinks. And a blink rate isn't related to facts, but it's still really awesome to learn about and study. So there are uh, higher probabilities of times when a person is more likely to blink. And also a blink rate will change depending on a person and the situation that they're in. So yeah, just behavior, different, different types of disciplines always have great things to offer about a niche topic. Even though it's a niche topic, there's like so many ways you can explore it that it's a lot. Yeah, that's really interesting. I'd never even thought of that, but uh, now it makes me want to go look up links and, and and how that relates to expression. It reminds me think makes me think of like interrogations, which is a whole other topic here. But uh, I do want to jump to some of the questions because we've got tons of people that are asking, and I don't want to keep delaying with my own uh, my own. So let me go to Kayla Rutherford, who wrote in she said she's considering getting an MFA in animation and doing a thesis on accents. So she's asking how different accents could be, or she said uh, that, that would specifically focus on how different accents could be supported or sold by facts and how different pronunciations impact facial expressions and movements for stylized characters. So her question was, do you know any researchers that she might want to look into, or do you think uh, this would be kind of a dead end? Um, interesting question. So, I mean, the first thing that pops in my head is the word fact sense. Um, <laughs> that's, if you had to merge the two and create a title, I think back sense would be cool. But um, that would be part of the, I think it would help you, but then you would have to look into more finer details that might not be available in facts, but that um, I'm working on developing like ways to classify finer movements. Um, for example, um, I have a resource called a facts cheat sheet on my website. Um, and I've created a couple of something I called faux, uh, faux action units. So they're not official facts action units, but they're like additional ones that you can use on top of facts to help further break down the face. And one of those called vertical lip tightener um, can be really helpful for that. Vertical lip tightener is really useful for breaking down speech. I think it would. I think facts could help you, but you would need to take it a step further if you're really trying to get into the finer movements of speech, especially as it would be affected by accents, because that's probably going to be like a little bit more subtle. Hmm. Okay, good to know. Um, I have another one here that says, are there cultural differences in facts? I know you, and then they wrote, uh, I know you said that it was universal, but there must be some sort of difference in expressions and emotional presentation between cultures. So what I mean by universal for facts is, like I said, an action unit is a representation of the movement that's created muscle. So culturally, we're not going to have different muscles. Um, bio like in a, a biological sense, we can have, like I said, there's a ton of muscle variation in each individual uh, from the same group or different group uh, within groups across groups. Like there's going to be a lot of diversity in the way that muscles are arranged or intertwined, um, how strong they are. Uh, there's also differences in muscle strength on one side of the face versus the other. 
Um, so, like, I think the question you mean to ask uh, is, um, are expressions of emotions universal? And that's different from facts. That's different from action units, because again, that's anatomically based. Um, there is a basic emotion theory, which I have um, I have mixed beliefs on. So culture is definitely going to uh, influence the way that we express, view, interpret uh, facial expressions. Different um, different regions will actually look and process facial expressions differently. So there are some areas of the world where they're focused on the eye area. Uh, other, the Western culture focuses a lot on the mouth area, and there's other uh, regions and countries that look at the middle face. So if someone has a mixed expression, for example, where they're like smiling, but also uh, doing a brow furrow, the cultures uh, or areas of the world that are more fixated on the upper face are probably going to see that more than they see this. So that's going to bias their interpretation of the expression to see something what I say at the top part, more negative versus the Western culture, which is going to be more distracted by the lower face. So if this is really subtle, they might not notice that and they'll just see this. So yes, it definitely influences. Culture influences the way we interpret and express our faces, but it's not going to influence the way our muscles are arranged. Gotcha. And I remember, I can't remember if you talked about it today or if this was something we talked about, you know, in the days leading up to this, but I remember there was, you had talked about how some faces just anatomically have missing uh, muscle ranges. There, there's no universal, right, truth. So everybody has this, so you have to be able to do this expression or, or movement, right? Yeah, so something I feel so silly about and um, is back when I was at Meta and I was working on face data collection. This is before I got really into an anatomy and diversity. Um, I would have to have people do different face poses and I was pretty good at getting people to trigger face poses and people would be like, well, what if I don't have that muscle? And I'm like, you have that muscle, but it's not necessarily true. Although I would say in the situations where that usually happened, it was people who were like, what if I can't do that expression for a brow raise? That's extremely unlikely. Most people, it would be a complete anomaly to not have a frontalis muscle. Um, <laughs> you would, you could possibly have like a, a reduced mobility for it. Like you might not have as much uh, range as other people. Like I don't have the best range for my inner brow razor, but I have a really good range for my outer brow razor, and that's different on different people. Um, what else? Oh yeah, and then there's other muscles that are could just be uh, like 94% missing in a certain population, or like, but a different population would have would most of the people have that muscle. You can also have a muscle missing on one side of the face, but present on the other side. And I remember you were talking to me about like you trained a lot of them on your own face because you were going through creating your library on Face the Facts, and so you're like, well, I need to get this expression, so I'm going to sit in front of the mirror and do it until I can get it or something. Yeah, um, like one ex one of the uh, action units, it's 39 nostril compressor. Um, I didn't think it was possible for me to do it. Wait, can everyone? Can everybody see her nose? <laughs> um, when I, f I figured out how to do it because I was on the, I was FaceTiming with my mom and she was like, look what I can do. And she did it a bunch of times. So I was like, I would just sit in my apartment thinking, do it, do it. It felt like bending a spoon with your mind. Like I didn't know how to do it, but then like at some point something clicked and I was just able to do it. And then, so I got so excited that I kept making that facial expression all summer. And then I started to get some weird like lines because the muscle was getting too toned. So I, I had to stop because I was like, I don't like how this is changing my face. It's too buffed. <laughs> you can make a workout routine. <laughs> like, yeah, there's a whole field, or there's a whole like group of people who do face yoga. So that's actually a really good place to study references. Oh, really cool. Uh, I'm seeing another question here, and this was actually bridging into what I was going to bring up a little bit was learning resources. But uh, Michael Buckley specifically said, or can you learn more about facts, various AUs? Is there a facts Bible? Where should he turn? 
Um, so the official facts Bible would be the facts manual. It's over 500 pages. It's created by the inventors of facts. Um, however, it's very behavioral research focused. So maybe you would find like 100 pages of it useful where it's actually talking about the basic movement and what to look for in those movements. But besides that, that's usually not ideal for artists. Um, that's why I created my website is because I didn't feel like there were that great of resources out there for facts. And I was often referring to these different like facts cheat sheets that I'm like, okay, this action unit's wrong. This action unit is not properly represented. This is, this is misinformation. I'm going to create my own. So I have a lot of free resources on my website and those are great for people who are just starting out or at moderate level. And then I have some premium resources for people who are more advanced and want to dive deeper. Um, so specifically for facts that, but I also have this book that I really like. It's um, called Anatomy for Human Anatomy for Artists. And I know it's not the popular one that everyone uses, but I really like the way that the artist represents the muscles and talks about the author talks about variation a little bit um and that i think that's really cool and yeah. Not, yeah that's really helpful um yeah i have a couple a bunch of questions, people asking basically what's the most efficient way to learn where should i start it sounds like your blog's a really good spot i know you have that that the um you know the, the starter but the starter what, what you just mentioned the starter set and then there's the more premium area if you want to get into the more specifics yeah one thing i really have been meaning to do is create like a more so the facts cheat sheet super great for your like what is an inner brow razor and then you can go look at it observe it um you can also use the other um facts reference sheets like uh carnegie mellon has a has one although they're not all correct and then also iMotions has one but they're not all correct so if you use mine as like the main one for what it what the movements are supposed to be and then the other ones as like i mean facial expressions don't look all this like inner brow razor on me versus inner brow razor on you like at the end of the day yeah it's the inner brow going up but it's gonna look a bit different the wrinkle formations are gonna be a bit different um so you're gonna want to look at more than one person's face when you're studying that um but yes i do need to i would like to create a more like step by step for beginners but you can still use that as a reference and i'm always posting like free things on all of my socials of random face related information so there's that too those are always super helpful this is this is definitely related to another question about learning resources from michael schwartz who said he's going to be leading a small group of students who's learning real-time character and operatic performances but he's asking specifically a minimum number uh, and the placement of the aus minimum number of aus Wait. sorry is that clear like is there a minimum number that you should try to focus his students on for aus for opera yeah hmm um, I'm mean, probably going to want to hit all of them out. Actually, opera, opera are super expensive. You're probably going to need to use all of them. Uh, when people, uh, another thing is people always want to take shortcuts and want to know what's the least I can use to do the most out of this. It depends on what, what your use case is, what your character is, how high quality you want to go. If you're doing opera, you're probably not just going to and if it's for a realistic character, um, if you're doing that, you would probably want to use facts and also go like a little bit beyond facts to get those good mouth shapes for the singing. And you could do that by studying opera singers and then identifying the fact shapes that you see in them. And then also what is lacking and what are you missing? And then you can add additional shapes for that. Okay. Very cool. Uh, what about, uh, let me, sorry, let me move to Nick Justison, who, hey, Nick, he joined and he said, is there any surprise things that you've discovered in your students that you wish more animators were aware of? Meaning, like, are there any facts, principles that you think get overlooked by new animators? Um, yeah, the the cheek razor thing that I was talking about before. Um, let me pull some examples up of the cheek razor issue because I have um I have gone over this a few times in um lectures 
and training session. So I'm gonna share my screen for a second. All right, so cheek raiser is the contraction of the outer portion of the muscle called orbicularis oculi. And that muscle can actually move in distinct sections. Another section of it is uh, where the lid tightening action happens. So even though these are from the same muscle, it's moving in distinct sections. So because cheek raiser affects the more outer bands of the muscle, it, it goes pretty far down on some people. So it pulls up the cheek area, it pulls down the eyebrow area. A lot of times it's gonna create these uh, different types of crow's feet, different shapes of crow's feet on different people. And so there's a lot of like facial fat movement going on. And it's usually at the corner of the eyes of the peak of that is happening. Lid tightener on the other hand is going toward the inner uh, corner of the eye. It will also affect some skin out here, but the primary movement is going this way. A lot of things I see animators doing are some weird mixture of both of them. And so in my opinion, it makes the expressions look really cheesy. Um, and um, these are some examples of animated characters that kind of have that like weird mixture shape going on. There's not enough movement going on over here, not enough stress going on here. And it kind of looks like a, like a catty gossip girl type of smile. Um, you see really similar type of movements going on here. And I feel that that's just something that could be improved by either remembering to uh, use the upper and lower part and have the range that you need uh, when you're controlling um, the movements that were defined in the rig that you asked to have separate. Remember to unseparate them when you're actually animating that expression or just having general knowledge of where that muscle is and how that muscle moves. So that is one of my pet peeves is specifically that one. Um, what was the question again, actually, just if there's more I could say about it. Yeah, let me see. I might have already Oh, fine. We can go to the next one. It's a lot. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, there's so many here that I'm just trying to keep them organized on my side. Let me go to Josh Axner. Josh wrote in for us asking. Um, hey. hey, Josh. Yeah, he says, uh, fact seems to emphasize breaking things down into its individual muscle groups on an anatomical level. But how do you think animators can control complex groups of muscles uh, accurately, to con uh, but also conveniently? Um, I guess it depends on what context you're doing this in. So if you're just, if you just have a group of muscles activating at once, like what are you trying to convey? And are you just trying to have like pre-done like sets of expression? So like instead of just a cheek raiser and a lip corner puller, you have like a preset of those two combined. Um, yeah, that I makes mean, sense. He also said that this is related to the control rig to simplify these complex motions. So maybe like uh, if you think it makes sense to break things down based on emotion or you're trying to convey an emotion or if, there, or if there's other recommendation you'd say. If you break it down and pre put a pre lump it together for emotions, then you're going to have a limited range of emotions. You're going to limit yourself to like, I only have one type of or this many types of joy expressions or happy expressions, you won't be able to like mix and match the expressions if you have, I mean, action units are not, in my opinion, some, like they're, they could be more complex, um, especially for certain parts of the face, like specifically in the mouth area. Um, so it really depends on what you're working on. So on a photo real character for a film, you're gonna need everything and more for like a really stylized um, like non-human game character, you could probably get away with less and by doing presets. But then if you do the presets, then you're also limited to like, can you add something on top of that? And you're just restricting yourself. But that doesn't mean it can't be done. It just okay. depends. Gotcha. Uh, let me uh, ask this one from Simon Habib, who says, hey, Melinda, thanks for the presentation. Off the top of your head, are, are there any movies or video games that you consulted on that you're especially proud of? Or are there any projects that speak to you more than others, um, specifically on the, the, the way the characters are expressive? 
Wait, what was the last part of the question? The last one was, uh, are there any projects that speak to you more than others? Like based on the characters, are they more expressive than other, other shows? Okay. Um, yeah. So, I mean, a product I was really excited to work on was the MetaHuman product and the work that I did with them, besides the training, I also consulted on their rig. That probably won't be out for a while for anyone to see, but when it is, I'm excited to see it. Um, for uh, movies and uh, TV shows, there's a TV show coming out soon. It's a kids TV show. Um, it's going to be on Apple TV. I don't think I'm allowed to say what it is yet, so I'm not going to, um, but that's the one with the chimpanzee character. So I'm excited about that. That should be coming out soon-ish. And then I also worked on um, a, a film called, they kept changing the title of it. I think at this, the latest uh, title was Gigi and Nate, and that one has a digital double capuchin um, that's coming out, I think in September. And all, unfortunately, everything I worked on in games has been like more related to like I'm training the teams. So I'm not, uh, I'll uh, do like a retrospective breakdown of their last release of a game, but um, I haven't gotten to see like the new one and consult on that, which I would love to. So if anyone <laughs> has anything like that to work on, I would love to. Um, expand more on that and have more examples. Yeah. Uh, here's one from Kieran O'Sullivan who says, FAX is a fairly well documented system around muscles, but it's hard to find information about the layers on top of muscles. Do you have any advice on how we can learn more about things like facial fat pads, skin sliding, or sagging? Yeah, um, that is such a good point. Um, I'm still learning about those things too. Um, I would say that in anatomy diagrams, what they show you is going to be just just like what I mentioned with muscles and how they vary the fat content location uh, where like how many fat pads there are. All of that is going to also vary um, to different degrees on different people on an individual or population level. So. I mean, depending how dedicated you are into learning more, you can uh, look at research papers um, from plastic surgery journals, um, or just explore different types of anatomy resources and just observing. A lot of my work and expertise is from just observing things and paying attention to patterns. Um, for skin um, movement, studying aging is going to be really beneficial to you as well and that can be largely done through observation and reading as well cool uh, what about common mistakes you see animation teams making when they're adopting a fax style rigged onto a digital human pipeline yeah so um a lot of times i notice that things aren't mapped properly. So there will be like uh, wrinkles designed on a particular type of character and the wrinkles are actually, you know, if you did a specific expression many times over time, you would develop a certain wrinkle pattern. And so that wrinkle pattern should be deepening whenever that expression happens. It should be directly related to that specific expression that's causing those wrinkles. So a lot of time you'll see a mismatch of the um, wrinkle formations versus the expression. So it's sort of like they're floating over or they're just like an accessory versus a part of the structure. And like they should be put there mindfully and they should work with the movements. Like it's, they're all related to each other. So having that like floaty type of look is a common problem that I see. Okay. Uh, here's one from Gabby, uh, Gabby, friend of the family, who says, "Did you play any? Uh, did you personally play any role in the Metahumans?" Um, not the ones that are currently released, but like I said, I consulted with the team working on them. I looked at their existing rig and I gave them notes on how to improve it. I did an extensive um, educational workshop style session with them over the course of a few weeks where I deep 
we deep dived into anatomical variations and anatomical diversity and how the same like same action unit or facial expression on this type of face can vary um, on different faces and how you could classify those different facial movements or facial movement types and wrinkle types um, to cover um, a wider range instead of just having like one cookie cutter wrinkle type or uh, yeah there's just so many different variation ways that um, a muscle can be arranged the muscle equivalent on a rig can be arranged that there was there's a lot to cover with them so Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, for your awareness and everybody else here, we only have a couple minutes left. I know we're we have so many questions that I'm trying to just get through as many of. I just looked down and saw that we are supposed to be ending in five minutes. Is it okay if we go a little bit long? I don't want to take too much of your time, Melinda, but just try to get through as many of these as possible. Yeah, we can we can um that, let's keep going, keep yeah, answering good. questions. All right. Uh, here's one from Claudio Quarasaco who says, "Is there are there any particular facts human shape poses that Melinda thinks some VFX industry struggle to reach, like lip corner polar or lip blinking? Or lip what? Uh, they specifically said like lip corner polar or lip, lid blinking. Oh, um. But more if there's like a particular shape that VFX industries struggle to reach. I think one of the ones I noticed is like a lot of people could be doing nose wrinkler better. Mm. There's just not a lot moving when that happens. Also, probably also cheek razor. Ones that have a wider area that they affect tend to be the ones that are not translated as well. Okay. Let's see. I've got one here from Niles Alley who says, in the animation VFX world, we often get to work on scarred, disfigured characters. Have you studied cases of injuries and how they affect facts? Um, not in the sense that you're talking about, but that's on my to-do list. But I know you've talked a little bit more about like atypical, atypical expressions or um, and how that that the studies mostly center around a universal language, but every face, kind of like you discuss, are different, right? Yeah, but um, like if you have an injury, well, like there's so many different injuries that you could be studying. Um, so that also depends. But yes, yeah, like studying um, injuries, like if you uh, got like a deep deep cut over here how is that going to affect the movement of your brows there's a lot of cool things to study from that but i haven't i haven't gotten around to it on my list of things there's always so many okay what about uh here's one from hugo mine that says does melinda have any tips on avoiding uncanny feelings uh on talking animals like how to apply anthropomorphic movements without having a strange feeling um it depends on how uh, realistic. If you're going for a photo reel, you feel like it's probably, in most cases, gonna look uncanny because <laughs> um, what you're doing is you're trying to create mouth movements that are not possible to do on that animal. Um, like, for example, funnel or is a shape that we use in speech a lot. Some animals don't have the ability to do that. So if you're trying to mimic human speech by adding that expression on something that is otherwise uh, true to that, the way that that animal moves its face, then you're like, okay, let's throw in a, like a funneler now. It might look a little bit strange. Um, so, it, there's like so much that goes into finding balance depending on the level of realism and um like if you want to kind of like fake it sort of like ventriloquists do um you don't have to get the exact movement down or you don't have the exact same flip shape but you could do like one that they can possibly that animal can do um but just like it's close enough to the shape we make when we make that sound, that's one road you could take, but I would have to see. 
Okay, good to know. Um, I, I got a couple of questions here about animators looking into almost almost questions geared more towards me on the faceware side, which is uh, we got Dan. Uh, sorry, Dan, I'm going to butcher your last name, but it, I think it's Bigoyo. Big Bigio. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to say Dan B wrote in. He said, "What's the typical process for animating the 3D face after having a fax map?" And he was asking about how you can go from a video to a 3D animated face. Uh, Dan, that's more my world. If you want to look into any of our software, uh, the faceware line, you can use Analyzer. Uh, to, to track the face, and then you can use our retargeter light uh, software to retarget all that motion onto your character. Uh, and then you can use Fax as a model for how you want to pose out your characters. Uh, but more than happy to talk with you about that if you're interested in the animation portion, then use Gabby's information, or sorry, Melinda's information as a reference tool for all of that for your character. Um, but here we are starting to wrap down now here. I have one last question for you, Melinda. Let me pull it up here. I just passed it. Yeah, and this is a, I think it's a good final question. This is from Ida Cazares, who says, any tricks to help artists not get overwhelmed when looking at the face to facts language? For greener artists that are quickly getting swept at, uh, who are getting swept away by triggering too many shapes at once, and then they end up counter animating. So, uh, face to facts language or like facts language? Um, Maybe it's just facts of language. Okay. Um, tips for not getting overwhelmed. Uh, you could start by just looking at sections of the face and mastering different sections. I mean, it's not something that you would learn overnight. It's something that you would have to like take time to learn slowly and thoroughly. And until you take the time to do that, it could be overwhelming. Like the fax manual, when I was first learning it, it broke it broke things down into uh, like a upper face and brow area, and then um, diagonal type of muscle pulling versus um, horizontal or vertical type of muscle movements. Um, yeah, just you would have to take it slow and then kind of like train yourself to remember what certain terms are. Familiarity with terms is going to make it less intimidating. Um, otherwise, it's going to sound like a bunch of jargon being thrown at you. <laughs> but also, um, the names pretty much describe what action is happening. And that's also the same with if you have a basic understanding of anatomy, the muscles that are associated with different facial actions the muscle name will also tell you what the muscle is going to do. So, for example, um, levator palpebrae superioris is a upper lid raiser. And if you look at the, the word roots of what each of those words are, it's the muscle, uh, the lid that, the upper lid that raises. So, yeah, sense, learning yeah. the word is helpful too. Yeah, I was going through some of your resources and was like looking up the words as I was, I was like, oh, okay, these are all anatomical terms. And now that I've learned one, I can start to decipher all of this as I'm going through it. So uh, yeah, appreciate you pointing that out. Uh, with that though, let me just say to everybody else, um, we have tons more questions here. At the end of this, and we're at time. So, but at the end of this, we're passing all these questions on to Melinda. So I would encourage all y'all to reach out to her. Melinda, I'll give you a minute here, just just to remind everybody your contact information and how they can get a hold of you. But I do before I would do that, I just want to thank you for all of your time today, going through this with everybody. I really appreciate um, everything you've been able to share and, and use you as a resource for everybody's learning here. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me and thanks everyone for joining yeah. and for asking good questions. It's always fun to have a party with a fax party with people. Yeah. Um, Thank you to all the, the attendees as well. Like, as you just said, yeah, now feel free, Melinda, if you have good ways for people to get a hold of you, um, I don't know, what's the best way? Um, the best way is probably email. It's most reliable. Like, I'm going to see my email. Like, if you send me an Instagram DM, if we're not already connected, going to go to the request box. So if you send me an email, it's going to go to me, face the facts at melindaozell.com. Um, that's my preferred email uh, contact. Um, you can also LinkedIn as a backup also works because usually the LinkedIn messages come through. So, but I mean, 
the more professional way would be to email me. Yeah. But if you just cool. want to chat, LinkedIn's fine. Besides that though, that's it. Um, Melinda, again, thank you so much for, for doing this with us and uh, hope to talk to you later. And thank everybody else for joining and we will see you soon. Pat, thanks again, Max, and everyone at Faceplayer and everyone who attended and I'll catch you, catch you on the internet, I guess. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Have a good weekend.